Hello, guys. Uh, welcome to today's live stream about the future of Ethereum. So today, uh, I'm glad we have we have invited several speakers from Ethereum communities. So there are key opinion leaders. So let's uh, start from uh, David. So David is from is a Ethereum community member. Worked for Omisco and Bitfish. David, you want to say hello to everyone? Hey, everyone. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. Okay. And also we have QJ Wang, who is executive director of Ethereum Community Fund. QJ. Hi, guys. I'm very happy to be invited to talk to you guys. And um, we will soon launch our new plan for the new year. So keep, keep, uh, keep uh, updated from us. Awesome. And also we have Raul Jordan, who is a co-founder of Prismatic Labs. Raul, say hello to everyone. Hey, everyone. Raul here, working on Ethereum 2.0, so here to answer any questions you guys might have about the topic. Okay, cool. Uh, and uh, we have Wei Chan from Parity Technologies. Wei, you want to say hello to everyone? Hi. Hi, everyone. So I'm... Uh... Rust developer at Party Technologies and I work on Party Ethereum and also the uh, Party's Ethereum 2.0 client. So uh, let's uh, hope we have a good chat. Okay, great. So actually, we we will also have Efri Shorten, uh, who is the Ethereum Hub for coordinator and the Parity Ethereum release manager, but he will like join us later in the in the session. And uh, okay, so and don't forget, we do have a, a live AMA on the Reddit on the Ethereum Reddit. Then you can you can look for like a hobby global, and uh, it's uh, it's called like the future of ETH live stream and AMA. Then you know you can search for that uh, that thread, and please feel free to ask any question you want to uh, for our speakers today, and uh, we will answer them at the end of the session. All right, uh, let's. Get started. Well, actually, I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, I'm uh, my name is Ross Jang. I'm the Ethereum community leader at Hobby Group, and uh, so I'm very interested in the Ethereum community and also the East 2.0 and of course the upcoming uh, Constantinople hard fork. So first of all, uh, let's just start with like some uh, questions for our guests today. So let's start with QJ. So because this upcoming Constantinople half work, so what 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 does the Ethereum community think about this half work? Especially, you know, we have several EIPs, especially on the EIP one two three four, that may impact on the on the miners or reduce the miners reward from uh, three ethers to two ethers. So, will it cause miners to switch to mine other coins? What will happen? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ross, for the question. Um, I'm just trying to make sure my name tag is not covered as uh, reminded by uh, one of our people here. Uh, I don't know whether I am able to speak for the community at all, because um, we, even though we have a few channels where we can pull uh, opinions and ideas from the community, I wouldn't, um, and there is a lot of uh, uh, mentioning of this uh, fork being non-contentional. But at the same time, as you mentioned, there will definitely be some miners that are unhappy about the decrease of rewards. I think overall, the sentiment is that we are quite excited about changes. The fact that we will make it more effective, uh, less gas will be consumed and um, easier for people to use in general. This is positive change that Ethereum has always wanted for, for going for better, for doing more things. And it is also necessary for the next step. Um, to prepare for the difficulty bomb. But what we cannot really, I mean, we, we definitely read some angry reddits, like uh, miners, especially ASIC, ASIC miners are not super happy about this and threatening to leave. Um, and this is something that I think is um, inevitable when you need to make changes and there must be some conflicts that will have to be involved in making progress because there are existing stakeholders, there are st uh, existing groups, people that are benef benefiting, profiting from 
the current situation. That's why it stays as it is. But at the same time, um, to answer the question of whether miners will switch, I think it would probably be even worse if the uh, the price goes dropping still, like with this trend. If we really don't do anything about it, if you look at from the other side, to slow down inflation would also help the price from um, the other side. And that would potentially also keep them for longer term benefits. Um, so I guess we'll just have to stay tuned for the progress. Awesome. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, from the, the price of, of Hobi, uh, Hobi Global, then we can see already seeing the Ethereum price went up from around like $80, uh, 80 US dollars to around like 150. And right now I think it's 120, uh, like for uh, for the past two months. <laughs> So, you know, I, I think the price, the Ether price right now is, is very important. I think, you know, um, based on my conversation with the miners, then they don't want, a, you know, the further split between uh, among the communities. So I, I do agree with you that, you know, Ether price is, uh, you know, it's very important right now. Okay, cool. Um, and so the next question is, uh, you know, because, uh, there are some like improvements on saving the gas for the smart contract and D app uh, developers. So this question is for Wei. Uh, so from smart contract and D app developers perspective, how does Constantinople half work affect them? Uh, so the, the, the Constantinople half work has uh, in total five, five EIPs and uh, except uh, the EIP one, two, three, four, all the other Remaining four EIPs are directly related to smart contracts and uh, just related to the app developers. Uh, so we have uh, three of those EIPs that is trying to organize things. That is uh, those things that we can uh, already do uh, in EVM framework, but we want to do it uh, faster, more efficiently. Uh, so this includes the, the, the EIP of uh, EXT code hash. Uh, which is the uh, EIP to, uh, it's a new opcode, uh, but uh, I mean, right now we, uh, it, it enables things like uh, checking whether an address uh, is a contract or a plan account more efficiently. It also allows things like uh, the, like if, if a smart contract need to check uh, a contract code is, whether of a specific one, but doesn't need to know the specific code. Uh, and we also have the EIP of uh, Bitwise operations. This is also something uh, we can do already, but we want to like remove all the, the opsy code and make it faster. So we introduce several new opcodes also. Uh, and for those, uh, the DM developers actually doesn't need to do anything. The compiler can pick the map by themselves and the newly compiled smart contracts will uh, automatically have those features. And we also have the EIP of the uh, ICS store, uh, net gas metering. Uh, this is a, a EIP of gas reduction, uh, which is precisely really useful for those smart contract developers that need to do uh, things like the uh, uh, re-entry locks or things like uh, uh, like some standard library. Uh, it can also uh, like encourage uh, other uh, like library designs which try to leverage like a transcendent uh, storage. Uh, we have one new shiny new feature, uh, the Quick 2 uh, EIP, uh, which uh, as the feature is pretty simple, it is a, a new a deterministic uh, new contract address uh, when you create a new contract. So, but this enables a, a large variety of uh, applications on Ethereum. For example, we now can build uh, state channels more reliably. They can do uh, offline uh, multi-sig or other applications offline, and and some. Uh, the app developers also mentioned that we can also give a new onboarding process for them. Uh, but all in all, uh, I, like, I want to say that uh, we, don't, we didn't have any civil bullets 
uh, in this uh, Casinoho hard fork. Like uh, everything is uh, incremental. We try to improve things uh, one step uh, at a time uh, and try to do it right where those uh, EIPs. And hopefully, where them we can uh, increase the uh, performance of the network by a little bit and also encourage people to uh, use the network more efficiently. Okay, awesome, awesome. Yeah, so um, so I, I think that's a good news for the smart contract and DApp developers because they can save some, some gas and uh, uh, to do the DApp development. And beyond this uh, Constantinople half work, so the Ethereum community I think you know, like, and then you know, people are talking, uh, talk, talking about you know what happens after this content and noble half work. So maybe it's the East two point and the things Prismatic Labs has released a demo East two point client last October. So this question is for Raul. So can you maybe can you please point to the audience what East two point is? And also, what is the current status of ETH 2.0 research and development? So, when will the test net be launched? Hey, everyone. Uh, so, ETH 2.0 is a big name for a whole suite of upgrades, including proof of stake and sharding. So, since the beginning of the Ethereum network, there's been a big there's been a big desire to switch over to proof of stake. Uh, there has been a lot of research and development put into Casper, FFG, and CBC uh, as models for for the switch. And there has also been a lot of talk about sharding as a way to parallelize transaction execution on the Ethereum blockchain. In particular, there's been a lot of talks about scalability at the base layer. How can we make it so that uh, Ethereum can handle real world usage um, in the sense that you know we don't need to worry about the throughput of a single dApp uh, clogging up the whole network. So to do this, there has been a lot of, you know there have been parallel efforts. So Casper proof of stake and sharding for a long time have been independent research efforts. Uh, however, at the middle half of uh, this past year in 2018, the efforts were actually merged. And the whole idea behind the research team was, you know, sharding requires its own security pool. Proof of stake requires its own security pool that comes from a set of validators. Why don't we merge the two initiatives into one single idea called Ethereum 2.0? And this term has actually been renamed to Ethereum Serenity since DevCon of this last year. Um, and instead of it being done through a hard fork, the idea is that there are a bunch of different teams, including my own Prismatic Labs, that are implementing ETH 2.0 as uh, you know as a standalone project. So essentially, the whole system will be a new blockchain uh, from scratch. It'll be a pure Casper proof of stake blockchain, uh, where users will then be able to send the current ether they have on the proof of work chain to a smart contract, uh, which will then queue you in as a validator on this new chain. So essentially, you know, we want to be able to leverage the current value of Ether um, and the security that the current chain has to onboard and create a whole new chain that has a lot of security guarantees and is ready to take on the next step of the network. This is a, this is a very high level overview and I'm very much willing to go into deeper, you know, into a lot more depth uh, throughout the questions in this AMA session. Um, in particular, like like I said, this will not be done exactly through a hard fork. So don't expect there to be like a, you know, like a Constantinople scenario uh, to launch this sort of proof of stake chain. Um, instead, what we're going to do is going to be doing more of a community based effort around educating the community what this means, how it's going to be launched and getting people to deposit their current Ether into the smart contract, uh, which will then turn you into a validator for ETH 2.0. Uh, so in the same way that you run a parity or a get node today, you would be running one of the nodes, such as a Prismatic Labs node, a Prism node, or a uh, Lighthouse node, which is done in Rust. Uh, and there are a lot of other teams also working on this, including Pegasus, uh, you know, Chain Safe Systems with Lodestar, uh, Nimbus team is doing this as well. So you would be working, you would be running one of these nodes yourself, uh, staking amounts of 32 Ether to become validators and becoming a proof of stake validator. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's very useful. In, that's very useful information because uh, you know right now, like people are still confused. You know what? You know, I, I at least you know from the people I heard, and you know, people got confused whether this Constantinople half war will become like a proof of stake for uh, for Ethereum. So, about you know, as well as claimed, the uh, proof of stake will come with East Point Phase Zero. Yeah. And one more yeah, thing, Russ. I think. Uh, yeah. 
you asked the last thing about when is when are test sets coming and what does a typical right. timeline look like for that? Exactly. So my exactly. team is doing my my team is doing a test net in Q1. So Q1 2019, that is in you know, in these next few months. So expect to see a lot more information about that coming very soon. Yeah, yeah. That's good to know. Um, all right. And uh, so the next question, you know, we're, we're talking about the, the layer one solution. And uh, maybe David can chime in about the layer two. So how do you see the Constantinople half work affecting projects working on layer two scale? Uh, it's, it's super exciting, uh, just in general, to watch the Ethereum virtual machine evolve. Uh, essentially, uh, a lot of these EIPs that are being implemented are essentially optimizations. They improve the efficiency of Ethereum. Uh, and how this works is essentially each operation, each opcode has a certain gas cost. Uh, and as uh, Ethereum evolves, uh, essentially everyone kind of has a better idea uh, with regards to how much strain on the system uh, each opcode takes. Uh, and so essentially uh, everyone's able to discuss it and we're actually able to refine uh, the opcode gas cost uh, and introduce new exciting opcodes uh, like create two, which is super big uh, for layer two solutions. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff uh, in this hard work that's super exciting. Uh, I would say create two is probably the biggest one for L2 type stuff, uh, particularly counterfactual state channels, uh, because it just makes creating those interactive games off chain uh, super easy. Uh, and then I'm also super excited how create Two will work with the new uh, co smart contract verification because you could actually have counterfactual interactive state channel games. And then you can have deployed smart contracts actually check the code once it is deployed uh, to make sure uh, that it's correct uh, with the other e uh, EIP uh, that, that performs smart contract ver verification. So I think there's a lot of uh, synergy between uh, some of the EIPs that are being implemented. Uh, also super excited about S-Store. Uh, storing information on Ethereum uh, is usually the most costly part of any transaction. So anything we can do to make that more efficient is amazing, uh, especially because it comes uh, with very little downside. Uh, the way it's implemented uh, really uh, uh, has no downside and only upside uh, just in terms of decreasing the, grant, the gas cost of each uh, transaction. Uh, that uses, or the majority of transactions that use S-Store. So yeah, uh, a bunch of exciting things. Uh, from a Plasma perspective, uh, when we're talking about Plasma, we're es es essentially periodically committing block routes uh, to uh, an Ethereum smart contract. Uh, so we're using S-Store quite a bit. Uh, so I'm very excited uh, to incorporate uh, the new S-Store uh, in our Plasma design. Yeah, a lot of fun stuff. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I think that's good news for both like Plasma and also the state channels. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. All right. And uh, so, um, so maybe, you know, I, we, we can we can talk about, you know, I want to bring up a panel discussion. So I have a few questions and uh, I would like, you know, each of the guest speaker to speak, you know, what they think about about these questions. And uh, and of course, you know, please remember, like for the audience, please remember to send me your questions to our online AMA right now, and then we will select a, a few questions to answer in the live stream. Yeah. Uh, so the first question for Ethereum users: What do you guys suggest them to do before the half work and after the half work? Anyone wants to talk about it? The user suggestions. Or maybe uh, uh, maybe start from David. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, because this is uh, uh, this is hard work uh, has been agreed upon uh, by the majority of the community. Uh, for the most part, it's non-contentious. Most Ethereum users, most people will eat, won't actually have to or shouldn't have to do anything if everything goes as planned. That being said, they should definitely follow it and pay attention uh, to it to see what's happening. Uh, because uh, there could be uh, unexpected surprises. That's it. Yeah, so yeah, I uh, maybe, yeah, go ahead, Rob. 
I want to add to that. Uh, I guess users should just be extra careful during the hard fork times because uh, you know people might be confused and, like David said, think that it might be a contentious hard fork and it's not. People might be claiming that they can double your coins, uh, you know, give them access to your old private key, stuff like that. So just be extra careful on the internet uh, with your ETH around the the hard fork time. Yeah, yeah. So actually, that's that's one thing I want to 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 add because you know this is not really a hard fork. It's it's considered as a, like an upgrade more. And you know we already got some like a user asking you know whether they will they will get some like airdrops you know because they heard some like rumors that this is a hard fork then they will get some like a candies airdropped. So like from the Huobi's perspective, so we will give like the airdrop our. Uh, we will do the airdrops. While if you know the product team is you know is legit, it's not like a, a scam. You know, just be careful. Someone is asking your private keys or something. And so the safest way for for the normal users who don't want to worry about this, you know, upgrade or hard fork at all, maybe the best way is to deposit the ether to to Huobi, and you know, from our side, we will handle all the complicated questions and after the half. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. And uh, okay. So the next question, you know, uh, I want I would like to talk about you know how will the Constantinople half work affect uh, Ethereum price? So who wants to talk about that? Maybe QJ, since you talked about the price before. Yeah. So I'm going to be the target here if I say go up and. <laughs> <laughs> and, and right, I'll past, be a backup. <laughs> <laughs> for the past years um, in crypto, whenever I do any trading action, any trading moves, it's usually it goes usually the opposite direction. So I'm trying to <laughs> refrain from commenting on the price because I'm overall positive. So I'm over, overall bullish in any in any case because it's for the for the greater good. So I'll just stop here. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I, I I guess I'll talk about the price since like I'm kind of I, I'm I'm from the like exchange side. So like statistically speaking, like the price like used to go up like when like everyone realized oh there's a half work coming, uh, you know, and then after the half work the price you know you know will. You know, will probably like go down a bit because you know the market was kind of like optimistic about this hard fork, and uh, you know after the hard fork and people re then people realize then you know the market kind of cooled down a bit. You know that's from our statistical um, perspective, and if you if you look at the Ethereum price as I mentioned, so the Ether went up from December from like uh, eighty. 80 bucks from December to around like 150, like in the beginning of January. Now it comes down to around like 120. I think that reflects the, the that reflects the point. All right. Uh, all right. Who who else wants to talk about price? It's a. I can <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't. I, I I don't feel like uh, I know enough <laughs> to give an educated comment on Ethereum price, uh, but I do feel I do feel quite confident. Uh, in or optimistic about the price of Dai uh, being uh, stable, it has uh, functioned surprisingly well so far. Uh, so, if you want to think a bit less about prices, uh, looking to stable coins uh, in general. At the same time, uh, the multi collateral Dai is coming soon, so it will have much oh. more collaterals to be to be uh, chosen from and 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 be used much more with the with a bigger reserve. It would be very interesting to look forward to. Interesting, interesting. Good to know. All right, mm -hmm. and uh, since like Afri is here, and uh, I'll just welcome him. Hi, Afri. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. Hi, Afri. Yeah, would you like to introduce yourself to everyone on the line? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Afri. Uh, I work for Parity Technologies. I'm uh, the release manager for uh, the Parity Ethereum client. And um, I also recently stepped up to uh, coordinate uh, the zero roadmap and uh, hard forking and protocol upgrades. Awesome, awesome. So I think Afri is the best person to ask the questions about this hard fork because he's coordinating it. So I guess you know the natural question for Afri is you know can you you know give 
I want like a normal users, non -te non technical people, like explain what is this Constantinople half work is and what's the impact on Ethereum network after the half work. And I saw, I, I, I somehow I saw there's another half work this year called Istanbul. Maybe can you share more information about it as well? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, um, hard fork is a pretty uh, uh, technical term. It basically means by definition that the changes introduced in this protocol upgrade are not backwards compatible. So we still use this term, even though it contains the word fork, it doesn't necessarily mean we have a shame split after this. And um, the changes introduced in this net network upgrade, this protocol upgrade, are um, in most cases uh, not really relevant for end users. Um, one, one proposal, the EIP 1234, is uh, the difficulty bomb delay, which is interesting for miners and investors because um, it allows um, miners to uh, mine the Ethereum proof of work chain for another 12 months um, by delaying the difficulty bomb. And um, to stabilize issuance, uh, it also adjusts the block reward down to two ETH. Other than that, the other four proposals are more targeted at um, smart contract and application developers. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. And uh, yeah, so uh, how many nodes have upgraded to, uh, to Constantinople right now? Over 9,000. <laughs> okay. Awesome. I, um, honestly, um, I don't know how many Ethereum nodes are out there. Uh, I don't know how many of them upgraded. Uh, I s assume that most of the important infrastructures that will be miners, uh, pools, exchanges, um, service providers like Infura, MyCrypto, all of them upgraded. I'm very confident about this. Um, I think among the end users that are running Ethereum nodes, most of them are um, not as closely following Ethereum or just lazy upgrading, I think there is like a 50% rate of people already upgraded. But um, I'm very confident that um, we will not run into any issues. Yeah, cool. Uh, so, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll speak from like from for me from the exchange perspective. So we already announced that we will support this upcoming uh, Constantinople half work. So stay tuned with our announcements, you know, in the coming one or two days. We'll see, you know, when it will happen. All right, and uh, so so let's get back to our panel discussion questions. So, you know, when Ethereum enters Serenity, which will be the next phase for Ethereum, mm -hmm. and so it will be using proof of stake instead of proof of work. So some people do have some uh, do have concerns on proof of stake, and uh, what do you guys think about? you know, proof of stake versus proof of work. Is there any transition plan for East 2.0 to cut off proof of work? Maybe Raul, you, you can, you can, you can uh, answer that? Sure, I can talk more about the transition plan. Yeah, so originally Casper proof of stake was meant to be an overlay hybrid mechanism on top of the current chain. So the idea is that we would have some sort of way to finalize blocks on the proof of work chain by using a proof of stake system built into a smart contract. Uh, this plan has been uh, deprecated in favor of a plan that would launch a full proof of stake chain from scratch by itself. Um, and we ideally want this to be the new Ethereum chain uh, enabled with sharding and smart contract execution down the line. Um, so with respect to the transition, you know, we we do want to encourage a full switch to a proof of stake chain. Uh, this would entail having users, people that hold ETH, you know, current miners, anyone that holds Ether in the network, uh, to either you know to switch. And, I mean, to deposit Ether into this new chain and become validators. Additionally, we want to be able to transfer the current state of the Ethereum blockchain into a state on a shard in the future. So we want to we want you know we don't want to cause any any extremely breaking changes uh, to how people interact with Ethereum today. Um, we want you know, DAI to keep functioning the way it is. We want all the smart contracts and dApps that are out there to continue functioning with the same access to state. So ideally, this, is, this will be a, just a major overhaul to you know, scalability, uh, throughput, and security. 
Um, and that's one of the things that we care about the most. We want to reduce the impact on people using Ethereum, uh, but we want to do it for the better. Um, with respect to proof of work versus proof of stake, uh, there are there is a lot to discuss with respect to that. Uh, I'll just kick off the discussion and move it to somebody else. Uh, but overall, I think that uh, there is a lot more a lot there are a lot more security guarantees that we can obtain by having proof of stake. Um, and I think people have are generally very excited within the community to have the switch. Okay, great. So who else wants to, uh, you know, give his or her opinion on the proof of stake versus proof of work? Um, maybe David, you want to talk about it? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I can, uh, I can jump in. Uh, so proof of work has definitely uh, been around longer. Uh, but I'm really excited about uh, proof of stake. Uh, just uh, for me, uh, there's uh, I really like essentially having the consensus mechanism rely on value that's intrinsic to the protocol uh, as opposed to a bunch of external factors. Uh, because when we're dealing with proof of work, we're dealing with electricity costs and hardware. And so the protocol, uh, the blockchain doesn't really have any firsthand knowledge uh, of that. And so it can't really adjust, it's, it has a hard time adjusting itself based off that. Uh, whereas when we're dealing with, say, uh, staking with ETH, uh, that's internal uh, to the protocol, so it can uh, react directly. Uh, also, proof of stake is uh, significantly better for the environment, which is icing on the cake. Yeah, yeah. agree, agree, yeah. definitely. It's, it's, it's the best for the Earth. All right, and uh, maybe QJ, you want to talk about your opinion on proof of work versus proof of, uh, proof of stake? Yeah, sure, because ever since uh, Ethereum started, the promise was always, has always been to to change, to shift to uh, proof of stake. And the fact that it would allow much more people to enter, um, to participate. And um, the crypto, crypto economics that are being designed here is trying to allow that it's not going to be, of course, it's going to be a bigger stake, bigger influence, but it would not, it would not diminish uh, the the network of the community to hear from the people that have much less stake. That's like the very essential design that um, I think um, the core developers are working on right now. And there are a lot of insights and contributions from the community. Um, this part is something, as David pointed out, is internal in the protocol. And it's something that the community can have it in its um, own control. And it would not be jeopardized or intervened or, or even disrupted by any hardware evolution um, or, or just any potential corporate uh, scheme that would happen to the community's um, growth path. And that's something that I'm mostly excited about. Yeah, for me, one of the things that I'm, you know, that I see as negatives um, are there, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done on educating people about how exactly it works, uh, what they need to do, like what can go wrong, right? I think it's it's a lot less intuitive to think about because um, you know it's a system it's a security model based on penalties rather than rewards, and there are a lot harsher conditions for acting incorrectly or you know not doing a validator being a malicious validator. So it's really important for people to understand kind of the risks that are involved with staking, uh, and that it's not just like a you know a money printing machine where you just you know you can just uh, you, you can just earn or keep constantly earning rewards by doing nothing um you have to just be very active with watching your nodes you have to be very active with understanding you know you have a reliable connection uh how is your node participating um, and understand the risks and the possibilities of attacks uh etc so i think i think just there needs to be a lot more community outreach on the subject uh, most of the implementers we've been focusing on the implementation of course we have just been really deep down into the spec, getting everything aligned, making sure everything is secure. Uh, but over the coming months, I think there will be a larger push to educate the community more on what it means to be a validator. Yeah, so regarding the penalties, from what I remember, I think you know if you go offline, if you are a validator, if you go offline, well, the penalty is different from a malicious uh, validator, right? If you uh, validate malicious transactions, right? Is that correct? Well, yeah, yeah. The system, the system doesn't want to doesn't want to punish you per se for just you know things that can happen accidentally. Like maybe you lose internet, you don't have power for a little bit. What's going to happen, however, is that you will after a while you'll start losing your deposit. 
uh, you know, by, by a certain factor. So it'll start leaking. That's what we call quadratic leak. Um, and essentially after a certain point, then you're going to lose it all. Um, this is basically to cover, you know, situations that can be accidental or such. But once again, I think the biggest thing you're missing out on is you're not reaping the rewards if you're not validating. Um, and it's, it's, it's still very important to keep in mind. So some people, we do allow the ability for some people to stake, to put in more money as a deposit than the required staking amount. Just in case if you have, if you think that your computer might be offline sometimes, or you might have an unreliable connection, you don't, you never want to go down the boundary of 32 ether. Um, you always want to be you know, safe against that. So you can put up a little bit more upfront to prevent your node from, you know, getting slashed or losing money. Yeah, I see. So Wei, well, what do you think about uh, proof of stake versus proof of work? What do you think? Uh, I think I think both both proof of work and proof of stake has is advantage and disadvantage. Uh, uh, for, first, for proof of work, is simple. Like it's really easy to understand, and it uh, proved to work for more than eight years or nine years. Uh, but but it 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 of course with a lot of energy, and uh, you can only get a probabilistic. Uh, Blocks like like the, the finality cannot be like determined, but for proof of stake we uh, use less energy, and uh, we can have finality. Uh, but in the meantime, it's a little bit uh, more complicated. Like you can't make it so. No matter what the guarantee is, you can't make it so that it's as easier to understand as proof of work. Uh, so uh, and there's still. Uh, some ongoing uh, problem that we to be solved uh, in terms of proof of uh, stake. So I would think that it's uh, like we still need to. There's there's a lot of still a lot of ongoing work we need to do uh, to make Ethereum two point zero to become a reality. Yeah, yeah, I see. So I, I free, uh, what do you think proof of stake versus uh, proof of work? And also, what do you think about the uh, pro POW? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so first of all, uh, I'm a miner at heart, so uh, I love proof of work. It's plain and simple, and it, it's proof to work for decades now. Um, yeah, but um, I'm also excited about the transition to uh, proof of stake, um, the so-called serenity milestone in the Ethereum roadmap. Yeah, but. Um, I'm only remotely following uh, the research that's going on and the uh, even chain uh, implementation, so uh, I cannot really comment on proof of stake and in the Ethereum space. Um, uh, regarding programmable uh, proof of work, what do you want to know? <laughs> I did some uh, in-depth research the last two weeks. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I just want to have some like a general idea on the pro. Yeah, um, so the idea is to. Um, squeeze in another network upgrade in the com upcoming months to uh, change or modify the proof of work algorithm for Ethereum miners to something that prevents uh, specialized hardware to be used uh, to mine the uh, Ethereum network. Um, in most cases, these are uh, ASICs, there are some around by Bitmain. There's another co company called Lindsay that announced they are launching uh, ESH uh, ASICs <coughs> this year. And now there's a lot of <coughs> a lot of people moving and uh, pushing for proposals that change this algorithm. And one of the proposals is this programmable uh, POW proc path. And um, this is uh, one attempt to uh, change this algorithm, and there's like a bit controversial. There are people saying uh, we are moving to proof of stake anyway, so why bother now? It's a waste of time, it's a waste of developer resources doing all this research, implementation, and testing. Others say it's urgent, we should uh, stop Constantinople and squeeze in uh, uh, proc power into Constantinople. And then there are a lot of people in between that are like questioning, is Procpow the 
correct choice? Are there better alternatives? Maybe we should investigate uh, different proposals. Like the Monero community uh, is researching um, randomized proof of work. So um, <clears throat> to make it much more flexible and ch change the proof of work algorithm in, in much smaller cycles to prevent uh, uh, hard hardware manufacturers from uh, building specialized optimized hardware for miners. Okay, great. All right. Uh, so as we know, recent 51% attack on Ethereum Classic, and because the reward for miners will be reduced from three ether to two ether, so some miners, you know, as we talk about, may switch to my other coins. So do you guys think the 51% attack will happen to Ethereum network? And then, you know, and after that, you know, how to how to give enough incentives for the miners to make them like become the cash providers. So I guess we will start with, you know, what do you guys think about, you know, whether the 51% attack will happen to Ethereum net, to Ethereum network? So let's just start with uh, QJ. What do you think? Hello, QJ. Yeah. So. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was broke off yeah. a little. Bit. Could yeah. you could you repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, uh, do you think whether a fifty-one percent attack will happen to Ethereum net network? like recently uh, what happened to Ethereum Classic? Um, I think um, what happened to Ethereum Classic, Classic is an unfortunate thing, uh, but we are generally very optimistic about that this is not going to happen. There's enough research and study done, and uh, based on um, like the polling, the, the opinions and what expressed it by all these validators that are currently in the network, it doesn't seem to be very likely to happen. And uh, I'm actually very curious um, from, I'm, I'm actually very curious about the answers from all these other expert, uh, expect, experts in tech and to see whether they have similar, similar views on this matter as how the community thinks about this, uh, this issue. Cool. Uh, so, David, maybe you can chime in. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. I I really feel like I don't have enough information uh, to predict uh, a fifty one percent attack. I mean, people can rent mining power, uh, and as more and more people start to see the potential of Ethereum. Uh, I do think that uh, there's like there will be more people who want to work against it or attack it. Uh, so my answer there is hopefully it doesn't happen. It's definitely harder for it to happen on Ethereum than it was for Ethereum Classic. It will take significantly more financial resources for it to happen, uh, but uh, but it could. Yeah, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully it doesn't. Uh, in terms of uh, miners uh, becoming Casper uh, Casper validators. Uh, I think it really all goes back to kind of what Raul mentioned with uh, education. Uh, so the first step uh, is getting uh, miners and other kind of large players within the Ethereum ecosystem to really buy in uh, to Casper uh, to get them to understand it, to get them to understand why they would want to participate. Uh, and then after that, uh, just with the way uh, things are moving with Ethereum, with uh, just multiple decreases in block rewards, it seems like a fairly uh, natural uh, transition uh, for them. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, so, Ra, what do you think? So, you know, yeah, how, how, so yeah. Uh, it's a very non-zero probability. It's, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a non-zero probability. Um, like, like David said, I think we would need a lot more. Nobody really has holistic information on everything happening in nodes across the Ethereum network and exactly when an attack could take place. If somebody isn't attempting an attack right now, uh, hopefully not. Um, I think the important part about switching miners to a proof of stake is 
aside from education, is that the roadmap for S 2.0 is also done in phases. So phase zero will just be a proof of stake beacon chain, essentially, where you can deposit 32 ETH, be a validator, where you can't really do much with the rewards you earn. You're kind of just earning them. Um, in the later phases, we'll be adding in sharding and smart contract execution. So at that point, you can send the rewards that you earned. Uh, you know, you can send it to other users. You can use them in smart contract applications on the sharded blockchain. Uh, so in the meantime, you know, we I think there is a possibility for miners to start depositing any sort of multiples of 32 ether that they have to become validators gradually. I think I think I think giving them the option to do it over time is really good. Um, Miners do have access to Ether holding, so they can they can go on and become validators as time goes on, and eventually see the benefit and follow some of the research in tandem. Um, so I think that you know it's it's a matter of just really encouraging them from for what they care about, really like increasing, you know, putting the Ether that they're earning to work. Um, you know, they'll be earning a lot more Ether, especially with like price volatility. Knowing that you'll be positive in Ether at least is really good. Um, so it's it's really a matter of just like giving them time, um, making 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 uh, development and implementation work more transparent, and eventually getting 1.0 core developers and 2.0 core developers discussing more about how to do the transition itself. OK, cool. So yeah, I think then uh, you know, point about time is quite uh, an essential key player, uh, key player here, because ever since um, POS was mentioned and a lot of other chains started to test around with it. I think the communities uh, scattered around the world are pretty used to the idea of having staking pools and there are a, ro a lot of initiatives that already started with it. So it only makes sense in terms of uh, even just um, uh, returns, profit returns to to put in, to, to continue um, being profit even from a minus pure profit um, like uh, perspective to continue to mine just for, for even the returns. Um, and I feel like this time that be, uh, before that uh, Casper is fully implemented is uh, an, a very ideal period of time to, to prepare for, for the Ethereum community's miners to get ready for that. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so then, you know, my, I, I would be curious to see, you know, uh, to ask how to give enough incentives for the miners to make them become the Casper validators, right? Because they already, you know, they already do, they already have some investment on the mining machines, on electricity, on the setups, operational costs, everything. So it's, especially, you know, when the Bitcoin chain is launched, maybe we need enough validators to launch the, the, the midnight. Then the question is how to give enough incentives for the miners to do the switch. So Rob, what do you think? Sure. So as of now, it's around you need around 16,384 deposits for the beacon chain to start. Um, and there are a few reasons for this, but most of it is just we're trying to strike a balance between going as low as possible to make to make it easier for people to become validators, but not too low as to sacrifice too much security from the network. Um, in particular, what's important is that the earlier you join as a validator in the beacon chain, so if you're part of like the initial validator set, for example, uh, you'll be earning a lot more rewards than once more validators join in, right? So it's to encourage a lot of early participation. Um, I think miners will see the value proposition of this. And like you said, they already have the equipment, they have the computers, they have reliable uptime, uh, and they, all, they also have Ether holdings. So, you know, I think it, I think it makes a lot of sense for them to hedge, um, you know, some of that in light of volatility, just put it, deposit into the beacon chain, earn rewards in beacon Ether. Um, and eventually once the two systems are merged, then, you know, things will improve a lot more. Um, so I think that's what's really that's what's that's what's really important um, for people to keep in mind. Uh, there are incentives for being validators early on. Yeah, cool, cool. So, so David, uh, what do you think? Oh, I, I was just gonna say that uh, mining is awesome. It's uh, quite proven, uh, but I don't really see a great reason uh, to focus on attracting miners in particular. Uh, to become validators when compared with other uh, fairly large uh, players. I mean, to be a validator, you have to hold ETH. Uh, and there are a lot of large ETH holders uh, who uh, run net full nodes and who kind of know how to do the DevOps, the technical side of things. Uh, and so I really hope miners kind of jump on the validator train, uh, but I don't think kind of that particular 
segment of the market is more important than any other. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I'm mean, waiting here to ask questions to to what David just said, because uh, I think the major concern would be if these miners don't switch to Casper, would they still be ETH holders? Right. What what that would um, do? What what would they would do to actually affect um, the market's stability in terms of price? And and that that's like one. I think one of the major pushes for hoping that. Um, they could stay to to continuously hold ether. Well, yep. do you, or if we don't care. Oh, we don't. <laughs> yeah, I think from the <laughs> from the exchange perspective, like we, we we do care like people who hold like if uh, hold ethers, right? Because like you know, like I think like Ethereum is like it's very important. Like it's probably like a one of the. Um, one of them, like in the most popular, like the, the popular chains available right now. So, and I think like Ether, you know, because a lot of people are holding Ether right now. And yeah, like we, we, we definitely care about, you know, whether, you know, the people who already have in, in large uh, Ethers will still hold it. And I mean, maybe, yeah, we'll, we'll see about that. Okay, and uh, yeah, so uh, let's uh, switch to the question from uh, from our Reddit AMA. So the user funny x fun. Okay, that's a very funny name. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, the question is for Afri. Um, so um, I have a question for you since you author EIP twelve thirty four. I understand that you propose a delay of the assay by postponing the difficulty bomb due to a delay in Casper and proof of stake development. So how will how will reducing the block reward maintain the stability of the system? So this question is for Afri. <coughs> thank you. Um, thank you, Ross. Uh, this is actually my favorite question. Uh, was, um, yeah, I'm the author of this VIP and um, so let's start with some facts. Um, actually, I'm lying a bit because EIP 1234 does not stabilize the issuance, but it actually increases it. So what we have is the difficulty bomb slowly kicking in, and the difficulty um, is growing exponentially. This means block times uh, are getting longer and longer, and um, the daily issuance during the the difficulty bomb, or the so-called ice age, is going down rapidly. So with uh, introducing a delay of this bomb, we basically gift miners uh, by giving them um, another 12 months of mining the work chain. And um, this comes with a massive increase of uh, uh, newly minted ether over a period of 12 months. And therefore, we decided to reduce uh, slowly the block reward to uh, counter this um, issuance increase. So, um, yeah, it's strictly not a stable. I call it stabilization because we, we have two different uh, angles here that are um, uh, uh, being addressed. Okay, thank you, Afri. So there's another, uh, so the user, some Jason guy asked, uh, what is the approximate time frame when, uh, uh, by when a complete switch to proof of stake will take place? Will there be another hard fork along the way? So who would like to answer it? Yeah, so for the complete switch to proof of stake, um, so proof of stake is part of the Ethereum 2.0 Ethereum Serenity roadmap. Uh, it's split up, like I said, in multiple phases. The first phase is a full proof of stake chain in which people can deposit uh, amounts of 32 Ether to become validators and earn rewards and also apply penalties based on behavior. Um, the, you know, there are tests that's being released earlier this year, and then there will be mainnet release probably this year for that. With respect to having uh, having the ability to withdraw that ETH and send it to other people, use it in contracts, et cetera, uh, that is the next upgrade. So that is what we call phase one and onward. 
where we'll be adding sharding, smart contract execution, and more. So the time frame for that will probably be occurring after, you know, probably during or right after the mainnet releases for the phase zero. So at, uh, later, near the latter end of this year, we'll be seeing a lot more work being done on that subject. Um, and it is it will not be a hard fork, by the way. So there will be just a, the, the new chain will be released. Uh, there will be a smart contract on the current proof of work chain where people can deposit their ether, become validators, run one of the ETH 2.0 nodes, and then they're good to go. Uh, there will not be any breaking changes. There will not be any 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 sort of uh, Constantinople-like scenario to the current proof of work chain uh, to allow that to happen. Okay. Yeah. So. So there's a question from uh, the user blockchain for life. So what will the TPS be after the fork? And what do you guys see as the killer smart contract or D apps for Ethereum? So who would like to talk about it? Yeah. Um, maybe David, you want to talk about Sure. Uh, my, my understanding is that uh, the transactions per second uh, won't actually change uh, that much uh, at, uh, post fork. Uh, the chain will just be more efficient uh, and it will keep running uh, at, uh, with kind of in a more business as usual way just because the difficulty bomb is being delayed. So miners will still be able uh, to mine blocks. Uh, in terms of uh, killer uh, dApps, uh, I uh, I would say uh, there's a bunch of promising stuff stuff happening right now. Uh, you kind of see uh, people much more heads down and building uh, in bear markets just because uh, there's less hype, uh, and so more people uh, are heads down. I'm really excited uh, for ETH uh, 2.0 because I feel like uh, once we have the beacon chain and shards functioning, uh, then uh, essentially Ethereum will be able to support uh, kind of quote unquote uh, killer dApps. Uh, whereas now, yes, uh, smart contracts work on Ethereum and they can do a lot of cool things, uh, but it's still very hard to use them at scale. Okay, yeah. And uh, so, so, uh, so the Reddit user, Ding Chuan, so he he asked if someone has a wallet prior prior to the fork, would that wallet be compatible with both Ethereum Classic and Ethereum? I, I think that's after the fork, right? Uh, okay, so which I, I forget, which fork, yeah. like yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I think he, what, what, what he meant is, you know, if someone has a wallet, has a Ethereum wallet, you know, before the fork, you know, after the fork will be, will, will the wallet be changed? Or what will happen to the wallet? Nothing. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay, good. Good to know. All right. And uh, so uh, the user, uh, Stefan Burford um, asked, so there's a proof of stake, the LPOS, I don't know what that is, and uh, delegated proof of stake. So why was like a proof of stake picked? So anyone wants to talk about it? Like why was proof of stake was chosen for Ethereum? I think compared to the other sort of proof of stake alternatives, uh, one of the That's biggest right. things was maintaining a high a high degree of uh, decentralization while also favoring, you know, favoring properties that would make Ethereum safe against uh, you know large large sort of attacks or catastrophic scenarios. Right. Uh, one of the things that you hear a lot of E two point implementers and researchers saying, uh, shout outs to Danny Ryan here, is uh, that you know Ethereum two point wants to be World War we World War three proof. So we want to be able to survive major world catastrophic events. We want to be able to survive having a lot of validators be offline, not doing their job for a certain amount of time. Um, I think by having a very you know simple but robust proof of stake model uh, with respect to how validators are selected uh, and what their role is, 
is really important. Um, we want to maintain, like I said, a high degree of decentralization with this. Um, and the current Casper spec uh, tries to strike a balance between these these different things, right? I mean, there are a lot of different proof of stake approaches. Um, this is just more in line with what you know Casper FFG and some of the some of the information Casper CBC has been over the past few years. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we'll take two more questions. And uh, okay. So um, the next question is: So what is Ethereum network? or like Ethereum community doing to promote the use cases for the smart contracts with proof of stake consensus mechanism. So what is the community planning to do or like what is the Ethereum foundation planning to do, I guess, to promote the, to promote the use cases or to promote more use cases for the smart contract development with the proof of stake? Um, so maybe, maybe they mean like once we have scalability and proof of stake implemented, like how can the Ethereum network grow, uh, you know, to solve more more problems in the world? I guess that's probably the question. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. So uh, who, yeah. I'm uh, I'm super excited about uh, not having to worry about probabilistic uh, finality. Uh, so with proof of work, you have to uh, wait for a certain amount of com uh, confirmations uh, to occur before you essentially consider a transaction uh, finalized, uh, and where basically you have some amount of certainty that a reorg uh, won't happen and that the transaction that uh, has been included in a block will continue to exist. Uh, and essentially, uh, with proof of stake, uh, you uh, don't have to deal with probabilistic finality. So as soon as you see uh, enough validator sign off on, on a given block, uh, essentially you can count it as finalized uh, right away. It's pretty exciting. I think that'll help a lot of smart contracts. Cool. Uh, so the final question is from uh, DIR2. Uh, so what is the current strategy for resolving a consensus error in production? So I guess way you want to answer that question. Okay. So, uh, so, so I think Danny's question, Danny has a really good question that, uh, we all need to think about, uh, but I mean, for the current, our current way of resolving a consensus error in production is actually not very different from resolving a bug in your software. So we just, if, if there's any consensus error ever happened, we will just try to uh, look into the code as fast as, as we can and try to uh, fix the bug and then do a release of the software. Uh, but I mean, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's like, but the, the, the problem is like, uh, we also need to, so the another thing we need to think about is how do we actually prevent a consensus error from happening in production? And that is why we have really long uh, hard fork time. Like we have nearly a year since last fork uh, just to test uh, the software running correct. And we uh, uh, spin up new uh, test nets to test uh, whether the, the new consensus are working correctly. Uh, Martin is also running some uh, full day testing and also other testing infrastructure uh, to make sure that uh, all clients uh, agree on a, a, a single consensus uh, state. Uh, but all in all, I mean, that's a really good question. And I think uh, all, all of our developers should think more about uh, like, how, how do we handle those uh, cases if that indeed really happened uh, in the future? Okay, all right. I, I think to be mindful of time, and uh, I think we're close to uh, the end of our uh, live stream. So anyone wants to have a final words to the audience? So maybe let's start uh, from, from David. Read up on the EIPs that are being implemented, why they're being implemented, 
uh, and then try to play with them. Uh, they let you do a lot of cool stuff that wasn't possible before. Uh, and if you want to see examples of them being used, I'm sure uh, some of the projects uh, are already kind of playing with them. Uh, so check out their GitHub repos and yeah, uh, yeah, play around. Cool, uh, QJ? Uh, QJ? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was just trying to unmute myself. Yeah. Um, community Fund uh, is going to expand to more than just a grant program. We will offer much more in terms of tech support and then mentorship and connecting you with the right ecosystem to see whether they need your missing piece that you're working on and, um, and also um, whether this project is closely related to blockchain or not, or whether it's just a good representation of the spirit that blockchain is trying to push for transparency, openness, the ownership. And these are all things that uh, ECF network is trying to do. So check us up and write to us. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Great. And raw. Yeah, everyone, uh, really encourage people to follow the E2.0 spec. Uh, right now, it's it's very much written for implementers, but I think there's a lot of work being done to make it more digestible and understandable. So if you look on GitHub in the Ethereum uh, uh, kind of organization, you'll find E2.0 uh, slash specs. So you, uh, dash specs, sorry. So you'll be able to just you know look at everything that's related to the beacon chain. Uh, as always, also follow the ETH research uh, blogs. So there's a lot of new ideas coming on there. If any community members have questions or want to propose, uh, you know, interesting analyses about proof of stake, they can post them on there. Um, and of course, you know, check out the different implementers teams. So I want to give a shout out to my team, Prismatic Labs. Uh, so if you look up Prism, P-R-Y-S-M on GitHub, uh, you'll find a Go implementation of the beacon chain and everything related to E2.0. Um, so yeah, so keep an eye out for more information coming out this quarter. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. So, oh, wait. Uh, I don't, I don't have uh, a lot of things to say, but but if anyone has questions uh, or suggestions about party Ethereum, or or if you want to know more about uh, parties Ethereum two point zero progress, please uh, reach out to us. Okay, great. Uh, so, Afri. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for uh, having me on the panel and giving me uh, the, the time to say whatever I like. So um, we have an, an all-core developers call on Friday, and we need to decide on how to proceed with ASIC resistance or with, with PROC PW, POW in specific. Um, I would like to ask the community, especially the minor community, to start some kind of wiki, some kind of documentation of um, performance of different GPUs using eSash and using PROC POW that would really help. And if this could be done before Friday, yeah, let's do it. Thank you for having me. Awesome, awesome. So like my final words for the audience, and you know, this, well, this, the transcript and also the full article of this session will be published on, on our Hobby Global blog. And you can also like follow us on Twitter like, at Hobby Global. And if you, well, if after the session you still don't understand, you know, what's coming after the Constantinople half work or you don't know what to do, um, I, I think you can always check our uh, our announcements and uh, we will take, uh, Hobby Global will take care of the rest. All right, that will be it. Thank you so much for your time today, guys. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thanks Thank you for uh, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay.